Hi, Paul. Nice to have you here. Could you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Paul Srivastava. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer of Penn State University. Uh, before that, I was the Executive Director of Future Earth. Why are you so passionate about sustainability? So I'm passionate about sustainability for both uh, some intellectual reasons and for some very personal, practical reasons. So let me talk about the practical reasons first. I have two children. They're both grown up. Uh, I have other friends and relatives and neighbors and communities that, are going to, that I'm going to leave behind when I'm gone. And I would like to be able to say that my life contributed in some positive way to in uh, longing the sustainability of the earth. I think a lot of the things that we are doing in our lives are uh, wrong-headed. They are going in the wrong direction. So I see need for people who can make some corrective action. And I see my work towards that. On the intellectual side, I think we have come to a point in human history where the relationship of humans to nature has, is in a process of reversal. So for a million years, we lived with natural cycles, uh, working in a natural way and defining the world. And we humans were sort of part of those natural cycles, whether it was the water cycle or the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle or phosphate cycle, nature had its own logic and we were part of that logic. Since the 1950s, there have been such a great expansion of human population and of the social impacts on Earth that we are now disturbing the natural cycle. We have become the dominant force of nature. And nature is getting broken in a lot of its ecosystems. So it is our intellectual responsibility as academics, it's our professional responsibility to understand this reversal and try to create a better balance between humans and nature. So I feel my work is trying to understand nature and human relationships in a broad canvas, in a global scale, on a planetary scale, and try to develop solutions that uh, will make us more sustainable. You have also worked a lot on management and leadership. What, in your opinion, is sustainable management? So yes, I've been a, a professor of management in business schools and in schools of arts and science. And I see management as a generic function of society. You and I do a lot of management in our own lives. We manage our children, we manage our kitchen, we manage our transportation, we manage our social life, etc. cetera. Uh, in the world today, uh, corporations are the major engine for producing wealth but they're also a major engine for destroying the natural systems. So management is the function, in my view, it's not about maximizing profits, it's not only about creating wealth, it is about managing human nature relationships in a balanced way so that we can create a system of producing well-being for all of humanity and be able to do it in a in a long time frame, not just for our lifetime, certainly not only for this quarter or this year that many corporations focus on, but for the next generation and multiple generations afterwards. So this kind of a planetary management of all the resources of the planet to serve the interests of 10 billion people that will be on Earth by 2050, that's the management that I want to advocate, I want to study, and I want to teach. What do we need to implement this? So there are a number of things that the managers need. They need certain competencies, they need a certain kind of awareness, and they need a certain set of values. So in terms of competencies, we in the last 50 years have found out a lot of things about how corporations and their activities impact everything around them from the physical landscape and uh, nature to uh, communities and social landscapes. So that's one set of competencies that managers need to develop. They could be in the form of developing uh, mechanical technological efficiencies 
uh, energy conservation and resource conservation, etc. Or they could be in the form of ecological efficiencies, so that they can do uh, more things with natural products and conserve natural resources. Or they can be in the form of social efficiencies, so that we create uh, communities and societies that are more uh, ecologically sensible and economically viable. So that's at the level of competencies. Then at the level, those competencies are based on awareness. So managers need to be aware of the basic principles of how ecosystems operate. They cannot just be economists. They cannot just be technologists. They need to understand how economy and technology are embedded in the larger natural systems and what technology and economic systems do to the natural system. That relationship, the awareness of it requires them to read more broadly, to be multidisciplinary, not just economists. So that's the level of awareness. Then at the level of values, managers need to understand that money is not the only measure of performance, that finances and dollars is not what uh, their own organization's performance will be measured by that we need to value other things in life. We have uh, a world in which there are a lot of people living without adequate food. There are two billion people who are living under $2 a day. And we need a kind of uh, uh, a system in which the whole world can live a meaningful life. And that requires us to valorize and put more value on uh, society, on culture, on arts, on equality, and things like that. So they need some kind of reframing of their own values, and this is not something that they will, they have to come to it by themselves, voluntarily. They have to understand the need for this kind of a, a broad prosperity and well-being for all. And by all, I don't mean just people who might be poor and in poor countries. I also mean uh, the natural ecosystems, and animals and plants, and, and creating a world in which there's a kind of balance between humans and nature. You, you often use the word passion when talking about management. How are they related? I've thought about this field of management, which is relatively a young field of study. Uh, it originated in 1920s or so with the idea of technological efficiency and rationality at the heart of it. The factories were being built and they wanted to make it very productive. So the whole field of management studies has focused mostly on sort of scientific rationality, bringing scientific rationality to the industrial workplace. To me, life is much broader than just rationality. Being a full human also means being an artist, being a family person, being a father, being a citizen. And that's not all captured within this narrow view of technological rationality. So I wanted to see what was the other side. And the other side is emotion. And uh, uh, science and rational thinking sort of separates itself from emotional side of things. So to me, bringing the emotional and the passion into management would, is a way of expanding the function of management. And I think it creates a more holistic way of managing. And to the extent that sustainability is about managing holistically at, across the planet, across all human beings and, and all other species, I think this kind of an expanded view of management, which includes passion and emotion into it, is a very helpful thing. So I see this as a, the next generation of management studies, which will allow a, a deeper emotional engagement and understanding of the phenomenon that we are interested in and helping shape that. What does your job as a chief sustainability officer entail? So in my current position, my mandate is to incorporate sustainability into all the research programs and educational teaching programs and student life programs and employee programs of the 23 campuses of the university. So it's like using sustainability as a spice to sprinkle it all around everything that the university does. 
because my university, as part of its strategic plan, has uh, stewarding of our natural resources as one of the three key pillars. So they have created this new position, and my job is to add sustainability across the board. You advocate a lot for a more interdisciplinary approach to reach a more sustainable world. Science, humanities, and art working together. Could you tell me more about this? Yes, so interdisciplinarity is a view that uh, has been around for the last 50 years. Uh, in an emerging science domain that has broken itself into literally more than 8,000 different disciplines. So we have created these bubbles, these isolated conversations that go deep, but they're very small and very narrow. In a world that we are living in, we have to think broad and at a planetary scale. We have to look at the big picture. It's also important to look at the individual silos and look deep, but if, you just, if everybody just looks deep and nobody's integrating and synthesizing and taking the big picture view, then that doesn't help us. It, it, it gets us to optimize at a sub or even sub sub component level while ignoring what is going on at a systemic level. So the idea of interdisciplinarity, and I don't like the term interdisciplinarity, I will talk about more about transdisciplinarity in a second because that is more captures my feeling of where, how this integration should take place. So it's not just that uh, biochemistry has to talk to neurochemistry, has to talk to physical chemistry. Uh, that is sort of within disciplines. But we need to step out of the disciplines altogether because the real problems of the world are not, cannot be discovered at the bottom of the silo of disciplines. The real problems of the world are happening in the world. So we have to take the problems from outside of the disciplines and then bring the disciplines, whichever ones are needed, to address to solve the problem. That to me is the meaning of transdisciplinarity, where you pick the problem not from a disciplinary gap in knowledge, but from the real world. You bring the right disciplines to interact with that problem. You engage stakeholders, communities, people who are affected by the problem to co-design and co-create knowledge that will solve the problem. And the real measure of how good your research is, is how well you solve the problem. It's not about how many papers you write, all the papers are important and you can write papers and books. You can't stop over there. That is not the need of the hour. The need of the hour is solving real problems in real time. Because we have 20 to 30 years, after which there are going to be some really catastrophic changes that are going to kill a lot of people. So on the one hand, we predict that there might be 10 billion people on Earth, but there are also scenarios that claim that if we don't change now, we might end up with 2 billion people, that there will actually be a drastic reduction in population. And if we want to avoid that, we have this 20 or 30 year period in which we have to act and we have to create solutions. So I say that yes, it's, you can write and, and think about it in academic silos, but you also need to be able to make change to the real problems. So bring your research to policy makers. Bring your research to activists and the public, to, the, to society at large. We want to create these interfaces between science and society, between science and policy making. What is the biggest problem or challenge we are facing? So there are many big challenges. I think the biggest challenge is sort of a, a self-imposed uh, constraint on imagination. We are in some ways creatures of habit. We are accustomed to doing things a certain way. And we feel that the artificial barriers that are imposed by institutions or by a society or by culture that we have to live within them. We need to find the internal personal courage to break out of those barriers and do things that we are passionate about. 
That, I think, is going to lead to solutions that are different, that are more creative, more imaginative, and will actually produce solutions. So the world is structured in a certain way, but God or no other creature told us to do it this way. We collectively decided. We are going to be in a university. We are going to teach courses. We are going to do it this way. But that's not the only way to do it. So we have to be really imaginative and creative and find our own pathway into solving the problems that we perceive in our communities, on the ground, in society broadly, rather than limit ourselves to the definitions that are handed down to us, either by bosses or rules or uh, disciplines. So I'm not advocating anarchy here. I'm advocating a open, creative, imaginative engagement with the world to solve problems that are very real now. And these problems are going to affect, they're already affecting our lives, but they're definitely going to completely change the lives of our children and our grandchildren. If you could change one thing tomorrow and money would not play a role and time wouldn't matter, what would you like to change? So I wouldn't say money plays no role. Of course, money plays a role and time plays a role. But uh, I, I have great faith in human ingenuity. I have great faith in the human spirit. I think people need to look at themselves and their mode of living and engaging life. And they need to find ways of enlivening Everything they do, every ordinary thing they do has to be enlivened and made more than it is. And it is possible to do this. It is possible to do it in your dining room. It is possible for us to do it in this interview. We can animate ourselves. We can jump up and down. We can create more life right now. And we can do it everywhere we, that we exist. So we need to rethink of how we are going to live so that life is expanded in relationship to others, in relationship to nature, in relationship to our family, to our neighbors, to our community. Who are the people who influenced you the most? Yeah, so <laughs> we are all a sort of accumulation of our many, many years. And uh, I am on the wrong side of 60s now. So I've had a long time to form myself. And sometimes I even forget what part of me was formed as a child. But I did grow up in a household led by a woman, a very strong woman, my mother. And uh, I, I, I think I grasped a lot of things out of the way she ran the family. She was a working person. Uh, Uh, she was a gynecologist, a doctor in a small town in India which didn't have any other female doctors. So she was, by the time she retired, she was almost like an icon and a big influence on the values that I took away, on the practical uh, need to care. And because she was a doctor and caring for patients, this idea of care, the value of care was deeply ingrained. Uh, it also uh, gave me the value for education and knowledge because she was trained in the sciences. And uh, for her, it was very important that her children and anybody that she could influence in the family go to school and college and do all the things that science has to provide. So I think there's a fundamental shaping as a child that happened. But I think I also learned equally uh, after reaching my own age of reason and becoming a person on my own. And again, I have to say a big influence on this has been my wife of 37 years. We have kind of grown together with a mutual understanding. And she has shaped a lot of things. And I always rely on her for, she's like my strategic advisor on on times when there are challenges, and especially around question of values and meaning. What is it that is meaningful to do in life? You know, so, so I take a lot of uh, guidance from her. And then the, the third big influence is actually my children. So I hear from them. They sometimes ridicule me. They sometimes flatter me. They sometimes make fun of me. And sometimes they are loving to me. And I kind of see in them a life that, has, that I have passed over. But I'm seeing them, and it becomes a form of renewal for me. So I always look forward to meeting them and learning what's going on in their life, what is important to them, what is not important to them. And I'm always surprised 
that they are thinking so differently from when I was 25 or 28 years old, what I was aspiring to. So they've kind of opened up the windows to the next generations for me. So those are the main influences on my life, and they all come from very close and within my family. And of course, then I learn from the books, and I, I like to read a lot and, uh, uh, and try to gain information from conversations with people and uh, the community around me. What keeps you going? I think uh, I'm an optimist at heart. I think uh, that the, the place that we are now is a place of turmoil and change, uh, both as a global society and also in terms of local issues. Uh, and I feel that there are better answers that can be found. And I am uh, eager to be part of that, uh, s that imaginative, creative space in which we can find better answers. I'm dissatisfied with the way things are in the world and the way things are in my own community and in my country, which currently is the United States. Uh, there are deep uh, sources of dissatisfaction. And I, would, and I think there is a better place and I think there are solutions. So I'm very eager to contribute those solutions and improve those things. That keeps me going. What kind of society do you dream of? So what do I dream of? This is a really good question. I think we all live our dreams, and we all knowingly or unknowingly interpret dreams on a day-to-day -day basis. And the, uh, the life that I dream of is one of balance. Uh, balance between competing forces. Uh, I have experienced life in the form of competition and conflicts, and I have always strived for finding the common ground, finding the place where we can bring some equilibrium to the competing forces that evolve us into the next phase. So my dream for life is that we as a whole global planetary society will be able to achieve balance, a balance amongst us as human beings so we don't fight with each other, bring peace, uh, balance with nature with whom we are on a war and we are destroying nature and nature can come and destroy us. It does so regularly in the form of floods and storms and so on. So finding a way of balancing with nature and finding a way of balancing within our communities, in our local spaces so that we can create well-being and prosperity in the long run. What makes you happy? My wife and I have been dancing Argentine tango for the last 15 years. And we see that as an embodiment of uh, the passion we have for each other, but the passion we have for a community in which we dance. Because Argentine tango is a social community dance. You dance with everybody in the community. You become part of the community, and you learn together, and you become friends. And so it embodies many parts of this connectivity, everything from the body, dancing is between two bodies, uh, the, the human body and the floor and the environment, the music, the people, uh, and the whole sense of community. So to me, it's a very good physical manifestation of the passion that I have for life in general. Difficult question, but what is life about? What is life about? Yeah, that's sort of a deep question. So to me, life is about, it's a kind of relational thing. It is about everything. So, and it is it's about the quality of the relationship to everything. So to me, life is manifested in ordinary, everyday events and activities. And we can make that life bigger by being mindful, by being meaningful, by adding ourselves, our enthusiasm, our spirit, and connecting it to others, connecting it to nature. So expanding that connectivity expands life. So instead of thinking about what is life, I think about what will enliven. So I try to make it into a activity that will actually expand life. Rather than thinking about it as a static thing, I like to think about it as a dynamic, moving thing that I can engage with and increase. 
so that I can have this conversation with you. And if this can be an enlivened conversation, it will leave us both at a higher level of understanding and also well-being and joy. So creating that joy and well-being and expansion of life, uh, I'm calling that enlivenment, is what life is all about. Thank you, Paul, for this conversation. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any comments. Keep wondering and see you next time again. Bye and ciao.